Darkfire Audio presents Call of the Herald, Book One in the Dawning of Power Trilogy, written by Brian Rathbone, narrated by Chris Snellgrove. Chapter 6 Men are fickle creatures, capable of kindness and compassion, yet fascinated by the basest atrocities. Argus Kind, Jean Executioner When Katrin pulled herself from her bedroll, all but Benjen still slept. Their shelter blocked much of the morning light, and the air was still cool in the shadows. Benjen stood at the southern opening of the crevasse, his silhouette standing out in stark contrast to the bright landscape beyond. Katrin padded silently to his side and put her arms around him. He gave a start at her touch, and she knew he must have been in deep thought, since he was usually impossible to sneak up on. Sorry, she said. It's all right, little miss. You just startled me. Not just that. I'm sorry about all of this. I never meant to cause so much trouble. I'm not even sure what I did, but now I've dragged all of you into my mess," she said, and she leaned her head against his shoulder for comfort. He patted her on the head and guided her into the sunlight. None of this is your doing, Kedrin. She looked up at him, surprised he would call her by name. She was so accustomed to Lil Miss that her name sounded odd on his lips. We live in times of change, and all of us will be affected whether we wish it or not," he continued. But it seems everywhere I go trouble follows. It doesn't seem safe to be near me," she said, wanting to tell Benjen about the destruction of the grove, but she could not bring herself to speak of it. You can look at it that way if you wish, but I suggest you concentrate on what you can do to make the situation better. You cannot change what has already happened, but you can prepare yourself for the future. I can't say what this day will bring, but I vow to face it with my head high and my wits about me. I suggest you do the same. You can wallow in self-pity if you like, but it'll only bring you misery. There's a greatness in you that you don't realize yet, Katrin, so you must not lose hope. We'll get through this together and be stronger for it. I know you're right. I'm sorry. And no more sorries from you," he said, shaking his finger at her. I'll strike a bargain with you. If you promise not to intentionally hurt me, and I promise not to intentionally hurt you, then there will be no more need for another I'm sorry between us. Do I have your word? You have my word," she said with a small smile. And I give mine," he replied with a flourish and a bow. He smiled and touched her shoulder. Come on, let's go make the best of things. Katrin felt a great deal of comfort from their talk. He'd forgiven whatever mistake she might have made, and now maybe she could forgive herself. She made a conscious effort to tell herself she was forgiven and was surprised at how much it eased her guilt and anxiety. She acknowledged that most people never intended to hurt her, her pain had been an unintentional byproduct of their actions. A great weight seemed to lift from her soul, and she decided to focus on positive things. Taking a deep breath, she released her anger in a long sigh. A renewed Katrin strode back into the crevasse with confidence. After they broke camp, Katrin helped the others stow their bedrolls and check their packs. Benjen led them by memory and they often had to backtrack when the way was blocked. Numerous game trails crossed the valley floor, and he seemed to have trouble finding distinguishable landmarks. By noon, it seemed they had covered very little distance. Chase, Strom, and Osborne talked quietly among themselves. They were worried about their families and the other people they had left behind. They speculated about the invaders, who they might be and why they would attack. Katrin listened in silence. 
She ached to know her father was safe, and she tried to have faith. Her mental image of him was one of strength and unbending integrity, and bringing that image to mind soothed her. She could not picture a man of such goodness and fortitude ever being in danger, and she clung to that illusion. I heard said some of the ships bore a symbol of a man and a woman in an embrace. Sounds like the mark of a Jean warship to me. As much as I hate to speculate, I fear invaders have come from the Greatland, Benjen said. The Greatland, Strom snorted. I thought that existed only in fairy tales and legends. There's been no contact with other civilizations for thousands of years. Only the old texts mention the Greatland and the Firstland, so what reason do you have to believe they even exist? I assure you, the Greatland does indeed exist, and the danger presented by the Jean Empire is all too real, Benjen stated flatly. You talk like you've been there, said Strom. That's because I have been there. But that's a story for another time. What's important now is that you know the Jean Empire has not forgotten about us. They believe the Herald of Istra will be born on the Godfist, and will be revealed through great acts of power. The Jean prophecies say the Herald will betray them and destroy their nation, or something like that. It's hard to tell just what they mean. I believe they'll go to great lengths to capture and kill anyone they believe could be the Herald. As much as I hate to admit it, I think Nat Dersinger was right. They've come to destroy us in a desperate attempt to save themselves. They will not find the Godfist an easy place to conquer, though. The Masters and a few select families have been making preparations for decades. You knew they were coming? Osborne asked, incredulous. In a sense, we knew. But our information was thousands of years old and it was nearly impossible to tell the truth from fairy tale. Huge amounts of information were lost during the Great Wars and the Purge, and no one knew if the prophecies were anything more than legend, but we did know the Jean believed them to be sacred and quite real. We did our best to prepare for an invasion, and seeing their ships over the years kept us vigilant, but we thought we'd have much more time before it would happen. I guess our calculations were wrong, he said stopping to untangle himself from a thorn bush. I don't understand, Chase interjected. How could you calculate when they would attack? It's a long story, and rather complicated, but I'll try to explain. About twenty years ago, we heard the Jean Church had started quoting certain scriptures again, the ones that tell the Jean their duty is to fight in the name of Istra, the scriptures also say Istra's return will be the divine signal to embark on their holy war. We know they calculate the Vestran cycle to be about 3,017 years, but by our reckoning, it has only been 2,983 years since Istra departed. I still don't understand, Chase persisted. I thought Istra was a goddess. What do you mean she has returned to the skies? All I've seen in the sky is a comet. A long time ago, people made up stories to explain things they couldn't understand. When a comet storm lasted over a hundred years and seemed to grant otherworldly powers, they glorified it and named it Istra, goddess of the night. The comet we saw was most likely the first of many to come. It's said that during the Istra noon, some seventy-five years into the storm, there can be as many as a thousand comets visible in the sky on any night. Some of the old tales refer to the first comet as the Herald of Istra, but others say it will be a person born here on the Godfist. I'm not really certain what I believe, Benjen added. He called for a quick break, and while the young people rested, he walked a short distance in each direction. He was pushing his way into some heavy underbrush when he exclaimed, Aha! I knew we were going in the right direction. He emerged from the underbrush with a gleam in his eyes. What did you find? Katrin asked, and he beamed at her. When your father and I came this way, we left a few markings in case we ever wanted to find our way back. Beneath the underbrush and a thick layer of moss, I just found one of them. We carved it deep, and luckily it survived the passage of time. Our destination is due east. About a day's walk from here. 
they were encouraged that they were on the right path, and glad they would not have to carry their packs much farther. Benjamin's excitement urged him to move on, this time leading them on a much straighter path. Try to leave the force undisturbed, he said. Any sign we were here will help track us. Now there were fewer times they had to double back, and as they ascended a sloping hill, the forest became less dense, allowing them to move with greater speed. Just before nightfall, they crested a large rise. Tall trees provided cover, and there were a few open spaces for camping. They made no fire for fear of being seen, but the mood was cheerier than it had been the night before. The evening air was cool and not uncomfortable. They snacked on their provisions and drank spring wine, but Benjamin cautioned them not to overindulge. Your packs may seem heavy now, but soon you may wish we could have carried more. Chase and Strom both volunteered to take the first watch to let Benjamin get some rest. Thanks, boys. I'll fare better if I can get some sleep. Sentry duty is no pleasure, and it requires concentration. Your first duty is to remain awake. Sleep has claimed many centuries, and their groups have perished. I suggest you try to achieve a restful but alert state. Quiet your minds and concentrate on your breathing. The trick is to keep part of your mind focused on sight, hearing, and smell. It takes practice, but once you master it, you'll be able to achieve it at will. Don't shout or make any loud noises if you spot someone, as that might draw them to us. Wake the sleepers quietly, and sleepers should try to remember to wake quietly. Our sentry's stealth may go for naught if one of us wakes in a panic, he lectured. I trust you will do your best to remain alert during your watch, but I think it'd be best if you double up for now. Chase and Katrin, take the first watch, Strom and Osborne the second, and I'll take the third. Periodically report to each other during your watch. Walk to where the other one is posted to check. Plan to alternate which sentry goes to the other. Changes will help keep you from getting sluggish. The night was quiet, and Katrin dozed off during her watch. She flushed with shame when Chase woke her from a deep sleep, and she stood for the rest of her watch. When morning came, Strom and Osborne admitted they had also fallen asleep, and they vowed to do better. When they began their hike the next day, Benjamin told them to be watchful for game trails, likely watering holes, and streams or ponds where the fishing might be good. The land we're crossing now should be within our hunting range. There's a lot of game, but it's crafty because it's had to learn to avoid wolves and mountain cats. Animals are large out here, and they can be dangerous. Keep your wits about you. Deep in the heart of the Master House, within the mountain rock that held the most sacred halls, far from the stench of refugees, Master Edling paced. Here, fresh air vents allowed him to breathe freely for the first time since he awoke. Like so many vermin chased upward by flood water, they had come to the master house expecting to be fed and protected, and like the great soft-hearted fool he was, Headmaster Groden let them in. It was suicide. With the emergency provisions stored deep in the mountain, those who dwelt in the master house could have easily lasted several winters, but with the boiling refugees, they would be lucky to last until spring. Even with strict rationing, they would most likely starve. We should send them to the cold caves with the Volkas, Master Baron said. They've got plenty of food. Groden would never allow it, the boiling fool. He doesn't deserve to be headmaster. That position is reserved for someone with a strong enough will to make tough decisions when they need to be made. Master Edling said. There must be another way. The problem we have right now is that the refugees are everywhere, like lice. Thank the gods that Groden has at least the decency to maintain the sanctity of the sacred halls. If we could get him to agree to isolate the refugees in the audience halls, we could collapse the entrances and be rid of them. And let them starve? Master Baron asked, looking as if he might be sick. That's a big part of your problem, Baron. You've got no backbone. Would you prefer we offer them up to the Jean as slaves? Would you rather be a slave or die free? Master Baron sat for a moment before responding, 
but Master Edling's glare demanded he say something. I suppose I'd rather die free, he said with uncertainty. You're boiling right, you would. Now, act like a man. These are terrible times, and if we're to survive, then terrible things must be done. By midday, they reached an area where the vegetation thinned, giving way to mature trees that were widely spaced. Benjen scanned the valley walls, looking for another landmark. There was an ancient landslide, huge boulders in an enormous mound of rubble that was grown over with moss. It looked like a sleeping giant leaning against a cliff, he said as he searched, growing anxious as they traveled with no further sign of a landmark. Wendell and I carried lighter packs, and maybe we were able to cover more ground. It was a long time ago, and my memory is not what it once was. They continued their hike for what seemed like ages, and still they found no signs of the sleeping giant. Benjen called a halt and looked for a place he could climb the valley wall. Maybe from a height I'll be able to see it, he said. I'll go with you, Chase said, following him. Katrin, Strom, and Osborne settled into the shade to rest while they climbed. We've gone too far. Benjen announced when they returned. Chase spotted some trees growing high and at odd angles, and I think they're growing out of the mound. Great job, you two. We must be getting close now. I trust your instincts, Katrin said. After a short hike, Benjen smiled widely. I think we're almost there. He walked closer to the cliff and found another set of marked stones, and they soon saw signs of the ancient rock slide. Chase and I will climb up first to locate the entrance. The rest of you stay here and remain alert. You'll want to back off a ways because we could loosen some stones. He warned. Using trees and bushes for support, they climbed the rocks, nearly slipping on places slick with moss. In a loud whisper, Benjen said, The entrance is blocked. I'm going to have to clear it and some debris may fall. Chase and Benjen stacked the stones they removed to the side of the entrance, trying to keep them from falling, but a few still tumbled down the slope and crashed through the trees. The shadows were long by the time they cleared an opening large enough for Benjen to squeeze himself through to take a look. The place looks about the same as when I last saw it. Let's finish getting this opening cleared, he said. From inside the entrance, he was able to dislodge large sections of rock, they took two ropes and tied them to a remaining boulder and tied small stones to the other ends. Chase and Benjen tossed down the ropes, and although the stones helped to propel them through the foliage, only one reached the ground. The other caught high in the branches. Chase pulled it back up and tossed it again. This time, the rope got low enough for Strom to reach it. Secure the packs one at a time, and we'll haul them up, Benjen said. Gather wood and kindling. Preferably dry, Benjen called down after they began pulling the packs up. Tie it off in bundles and we'll haul them up. Katrin and Osborne scrambled to find wood in the failing light, while Strom tied the bundles and guided them as they rose. Benjen's request for wood meant they would have a fire, which was reassuring, because it meant he felt they were safely away from any pursuers. When darkness threatened to make scrounging impossible, they made the climb while they could still see, a relatively easy task when unencumbered. No one spoke as they passed through the entrance and stared at the sight before them. The narrow opening emptied into a spacious hallway, which sloped downward at an angle. Perfectly rectangular, the hall was clearly not a natural formation, which was further evidenced by the worn scrollwork that decorated the lichen-covered walls. A short distance ahead, the hall gave way to a cavernous chamber. Its floor was littered with debris and the bones of small animals, and despite its relatively smooth appearance, it was pocked with small holes. A narrow opening in the ceiling let in moonlight, which was reflected by the still waters of a subterranean lake. As they crossed the area that stood between them and the lake, the massive size of the cavern became apparent, and the scale of it dwarfed them. The vaulted ceiling was almost invisible in the growing darkness, and the dark waters of the lake seemed to stretch on forever in the distance. What is this place? Katrin asked. 
Benjamin stood up from the bags he had been unpacking and joined the others. Your father and I found this place by accident when looking for shelter from a storm. We couldn't figure out much about it, other than the fact that this chamber had once been inhabited, possibly before the purge. Other passages once led to this chamber, but they all had been blocked or the ceilings had collapsed. We investigated a bit, even built a small raft we used to explore. I bet it's still here. His eyes took on a faraway look as he remembered the time long past, but he pulled himself from his memories and returned to the present. Let's get a fire started, shall we? I'm hungry, and I'd really like some hot food. We can explore later. Katrin got the tinderbox from her pack and started a fire. Don't make the fire very large, little miss, Benjamin warned. We haven't put anything across the entrance yet, and the light could give us away. The cabin's big enough that it'll take up the smoke before it escapes through that hole up there, but we'll still need to be careful. The lake water should be safe to drink, he continued, but I think it'd be best to boil it first. There's a kettle in one of the bags. After the water is boiled, you can put the kettle in a shallow part of the lake to cool it quickly. Let's fill our flasks, too. Katrin and Strom set about boiling water and getting ingredients together for a stew. She was glad to see Benjamin pull recurved bows, strings, and several quivers of arrows from one of the long bags, along with a couple of short fishing poles. Long before the stew was really done, they decided it had cooked long enough and fell to it. Full stomachs made them sleepy, and they were soon curling up in their bedding, letting Benjamin take the first watch. On trembling legs, Nat approached the ruins of the great oak grove. Tears filled his eyes as he beheld what had once been a sacred and beautiful place. Now it looked more like a battlefield of epic scale, like a vision of what was yet to come. Katrin. This was where she and her friends had come to camp. They were here when the storm struck. She had to be connected to the destruction. This place had been undisturbed for thousands of years, and after only one night in her presence, it was destroyed. The evidence around him only served to strengthen his convictions. He had to do something, but he lacked the resources and connections. There was only one person who could do what needed to be done. Miss Maris. Only she was powerful enough within the Vestrana to make such a decision. As he crept back to town, sliding from shadow to shadow, his mind was consumed, trying to find the words to convince Miss Maris that he was right. It would not be easy, but he had to succeed. To fail again would mean certain disaster.